Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about gene regulation in eukaryotes. So, gene regulation in eukaryotes. Now, you could probably have a whole course on this subject. Um, but we will just have, I think, three videos. And in this video right here, we are going to review the general transcription factors. This is something we talked about, I believe, in lecture 13. We will also talk about transcriptional activators. transcriptional repressors and all of these are proteins right here we will talk about the mediator complex which is a giant complex in eukaryotes with over 30 subunits and we will talk about some regulatory elements called enhancers silencers and we will review promoters and we will also talk about the histone code hypothesis so a lot of things to talk about here and we are only going to discuss these briefly. Now we, we talked about basic recruitment in the past where uh, we, we must have the general transcription factors loaded onto the promoter of a gene in eukaryotes in order for that gene to be transcribed. And in the past I had, had mentioned some of these other things and said we will consider all these other things to be advanced recruitment so things that will influence the transcription rate assuming the general transcription factors can be loaded onto the promoter and transcription can start you know all these other things are going to control how often transcription starts so now, maybe the best way to do this is to start with a hypothetical transcriptional activator, let's say in the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell. Now, here will be the nuclear membrane here. And these things right here, these are nuclear pores. Now, there's a giant complex that that spans the nuclear membrane, it's the nuclear pore complex, and it regulates what goes in and out of the nucleus. Now, obviously this isn't to scale because this transcriptional activator is not gonna fit through that little pore right there, so it's not to scale. Now, imagine there is some signal, and if you wanna learn more about cell signaling, I encourage, I encourage you to take uh, BSC 351, our cell signaling course with Kevin Edwards. So imagine there's some signal that leads to this transcriptional activator, which is sitting or waiting in the cytoplasm. And let's say it gets phosphorylated because of this signal. And let's say the phosphorylated form of the transcriptional activator is the active form and it's imported, when it's phosphorylated, it's imported into the nucleus where it will bind to a regulatory element called an enhancer. Now I'm gonna diagram this chromosome condensed just because, you know, we all know what a condensed chromosome looks like. And by diagramming like that, you know that this little loop coming off of here, or a long loop, is DNA. So let's say that's a loop of DNA. And you know during interphase, chromosomes aren't condensed like this. But so here's a loop of DNA right here. Now let's assume that the enhancer 
which is a sequence, you know, a specific sequence along this DNA molecule. Now the transcriptional activator binds the enhancer. And let's say we have two transcriptional activators bound to the enhancer. But let's say the gene that these transcriptional activators are known to increase the transcription of is located far away. Let's say these are tens of thousands of base pairs, tens of thousands of base pairs between here and, and here. Let's say this is the promoter of the gene that needs to be transcribed. And this right here, let's say this is the coding sequence of, of the gene. And enhancers can be closer, they can be in uh, within the coding region, they could be within the gene, they could be within the promoter, but here we're talking about an enhancer that's located far away. And what's amazing is that these enhancers, which are located far away, can influence the transcription of genes that you know are located at, at quite a, a distance away. So how these work, or how they're thought to work, is they will interact with the mediator complex which is that giant protein complex. I'm going to draw it like this, like this here, and you can imagine that all there are about 30, over 30 different proteins interacting in this complex here. And some cells will have a mediator complex with not all of the subunits, and some of the subunits can be exchanged, and that may influence how different genes are expressed in different cells. Now the mediator complex coordinates interactions between the transcriptional activators and the general transcription factors. So let's say these are the general transcription factors loaded onto the promoter and they are interacting with the mediator complex. So we have the mediator, I should write mediator here, coordinating interactions between the GTFs and the transcriptional activators. So they're stabilizing this interaction right here. And mediator and the general transcription factors are interacting with RNA polymerase. My diagram's getting kind of messy here. And they're loading RNA polymerase onto this promoter. So you can imagine that without the transcriptional activators interacting with mediator, this whole loop structure right here will not be very stable and RNA polymerase will not be loaded onto the promoter as efficiently as it is when the transcriptional activators and mediator are present. Okay, so when this RNA polymerase is loaded onto the promoter, it can transcribe the coding sequence. So that's an example of how transcriptional activators may bind to an enhancer that's located very far from the gene we can have this loop of DNA forming and there could be tens of thousands of base pairs in this DNA right here. And by interacting with mediator and the general transcription factors, we can get RNA polymerase loaded onto that promoter in an efficient way to get this gene transcribed. Now, what about the silencers? How do the silencers work? Well, the silencers uh, are bound by transcriptional repressors and the same thing, the same thing can happen except in this case, the interaction with mediator, may, it may interact in a way where the general transcription factors in RNA polymerase aren't loaded onto the promoter. Let's say this is the promoter here, coding sequence. Uh, put a little arrow there so we know which way RNA polymerase is supposed to transcribe. And let's say the silencer is over here. And here we have transcriptional repressor, transcriptional repressor, interacting with mediator. Put all some of the subunits in here. And here we have some GTFs interacting with mediator. 
but you can see they're nowhere near the promoter for this gene that would otherwise be be transcribed if mediator was interacting with let's say this enhancer down here so when the transcription repressors are present mediators down here the gtfs are here they're nowhere near the promoter rna polymerase is not going to be loaded onto this promoter so that's how the silencers could work there's one way they can work one way they are thought to work now we left something out here right so there so I, I diagram DNA here, and even in the other situation here, the first situation with the activators and uh, the enhan enhancer and the activators, you know, I, I didn't diagram the nucleosomes, right? So now we've talked about nucleosomes in the past, and what they are is made up of an octomer of histones. Right here, we also have the linker histone, H1 for a ninth histone. So octamer of histones. And the DNA wraps around these things. Now the histones, each histone has a histone tail. And the histone tails can be covalently modified. And those covalent modifications influence how these tails interact with DNA and other DNA and other proteins um, surrounding the DNA, and those proteins can influence how quickly this this how often genes are transcribed. So let me just talk a little bit about the histone code hypothesis. So let me diagram one octamer of histones and I believe we talked about this in lecture 13 so octamer of histones in the nucleosome is the octamer of histones plus I think it's 147 base pairs of DNA that wraps around this and here I'll wrap the DNA around here and this is the linker DNA that's found between Octomers of histones, and it is thought to associate with another histone called histone 1. Now, these histones right here, we have four types, right? Histone 2A, histone 2B, histone 3, and histone 4. And now let's just look at the tail of histone 3. And it's a little misleading calling it a tail because remember how proteins have an N terminal N? which is like the beginning of the protein, and a C-terminal end, which is the end of the protein. Well, the tail actually starts at the end terminus, the end terminal end. Now, this is the tail part. And why do we call it a tail? Because it kind of hangs off of the globular part of the histone, like a tail. Now, the tail is made up of 20 to 40 amino acids, depending on which histone we're talking about here. So I can start diagramming in or labeling some of the amino acids in this tail. Um, I have some notes on this here, and I didn't leave enough room to diagram all of them, but you can see here are some amino acids. And so arginine here, now arginine amino acids can be methylated. Lysines can be acetylated or methylated. Um, here's another lysine right here, acetylated or methylated. So lots of these amino acids here can be modified in different ways. I think uh, phosphorylation is another one, and ubiquitination is one. Now in mammals, there are over 50 enzymes charged with modifying the histone tails. So the histone code hypothesis holds that covalent modifications of these tails influences the expression of genes associated with the nucleosomes. So how could that happen? So there are a number of different ways this can happen and some of the most popular 
explanations for how the histone code controls gene expression is that some covalent mod, we'll call them covalent modifications, covalent mods equal chromatin compaction. Okay, so what does that mean? So let's take one octamer of histones right here. And let's put histone one here. And let's put another octamer of histones right here. And you can see what I mean by chromatin compaction. So we're gonna put all these nucleosomes, I didn't put the DNA in yet, but octamers of histones really close together. And I can diagram the DNA in here. So we've got four nucleosomes here. And you can imagine if there's a promoter somewhere in here that the general transcription factors are gonna have a really hard time finding that promoter and binding, say, to the Tata box, right? Um, so the chromatin is compact and it, it's really difficult for transcription factors, general transcription factors to find the binding spot. And for this, for any genes that are found in compact chromatin to be transcribed. And some covalent modifications of the histone tails are thought to influence how tightly compact the chromatin is. So conversely, some mods of the histone tails equal or encourage a loosening of the chromatin or loose chromatin. Now I can quickly diagram that for you. Octamer of histones here, wrap the DNA around to get the nucleosome, and then we'll have another octamer of histones over here, wrap the DNA, we've got the nucleosome here, and you can see that, okay, if this was the Tata box right here for a promoter, well, it's no longer in a compact um, chromatin uh, or yeah, compact chromatin arrangement. So the general transcription factors can find this and they can bind it. And this, let's say, coding region right here, this uh, gene can be transcribed. And also there's a lot of research on this stuff right here. Let's say this is the first, this is a little off subject, but this is, the, let's say, the first um, nucleosome within the coding region of the gene or the part that needs to be transcribed, this would be the plus one nucleosome. And how this is moved out of the way, there's a lot of uh, interesting research and highly detailed research on how this is pushed out of the way so that gene can be transcribed. But uh, long story short, one of the, the, I guess, most favored explanations for how histone tail modifications control gene transcription is that histone tail modifications influence how compact the chromatin is. If uh, the certain modifications cause chromatin to be compact, genes in that area will not be transcribed. If the histone modifications cause the chromatin to be loose, then those genes are able to be transcribed. Okay, so that's all we're gonna do on the histone code hypothesis, mostly because I don't have any really like interesting specific examples on this subject yet. I hope to do that for future iterations of this course. But I do have um, some interesting examples, or at least one interesting example on DNA methylation, which we will talk about in the next video. So how DNA methylation controls the, I guess, expression of genes in eukaryotes. Okay, so see you in the next video.